What's going on, my good people? Mike Hidalgo here. Thank you for joining us on another FCP Euro DIY. Today, we're going to be working on a 2008 Audi TT Mark II. Today on the Audi TT behind me, we're going to be covering how to replace your front struts. This will be applicable to all Mark II TT chassis. Now, as you can see in front of me, we have some Bilstein struts along with some Lemforder strut mounts and a couple other parts. And that's because this vehicle is one of those while you're in there type of cars when it comes to the strut replacement. In order to replace the strut on the TT behind us, we have to remove the whole spindle assembly. And at that point, you have the wheel bearing nice and exposed and your ball joint, as well as a couple other things. But for today, we're gonna to cover the strut replacement along with the wheel bearing and ball joint as those are while you're in their items. So not necessarily a must, but definitely something nice to do if you can swing it while you're taking the car apart. In addition to that, we'll be removing the brakes and calipers as well. So a couple other torque specs in there for you guys looking for some torque specs. Now, typically as these units start to fail, you're gonna get a bumpy ride up front. Sometimes it'll get a little springy. As these wear out, the car tends to just ride on the springs and rely on that more than anything as the compression in these units goes. Oftentimes the strut mounts can fail. They just start to squish or collapse or the rubber starts to degrade. And that's actually what happened to this car. The ride wasn't so much terrible at 122,000 miles, but the strut mounts have failed. So every time you hit a bump, it was just a nice clunk. So from there, we uh, decided to go ahead and replace them and tackle some other OE parts. As you can see on my right side, we have the old strut assembly, which when compared to the new one, just off the rip, you can tell that the shaft won't even sit as high as the new Bilstein unit does. It has lost most of its compression, uh, which is pretty standard for a car with 122,000 miles. They'll typically last you anywhere from 60 to 100K, depending on the kind of driving conditions your car sees. And then moving forward, the wheel bearing is another wear item. This one wasn't in terrible shape, but it is definitely nothing compared to the nice new one that we're gonna be installing from Scheffler. And then last but not least was the ball joint, which we decided to remove as well. We'll show you how to replace all these parts while we're at it. But before we get started on this DIY, let's take a look at some of the tools we're gonna need for this job. For this job, you're gonna need your basic socket set. You're gonna need some torque wrenches and ratchets, along with a set of triple squares and some torques. We'll get you the full detail list over on my right if you want to go ahead and pause in the next few seconds. But some key tools I wanted to point out which will make this job a whole lot easier are the following. We're going to use a pass-through socket set. This is CTA 7466. This has all the pass-through bits that you need to do any suspension work on any vehicle. Um, it comes in really handy. It even helps you when you're doing tie rod end links or uh, sway bar end links, either one, as they have the pass-through and counter hold tools in them. We also have a spring compressor. Now this is super important to have the proper and correct tool to do this job. If you do not have one of these, I highly stress you just take your new parts and your old struts assemblies to a local shop that you trust, have them disassemble and assemble your struts for you. The money you're saving on the DIY, you can go ahead and put a little bit towards this job and then go ahead and continue on with your replacement. Another thing that's gonna come in handy is a ball joint separator tool. You can use a pickle fork. Um, something that's a little bit more gentle would be the CTA tool in front of me. This is CTA 4013. We also have some electric tools, which will make this job a little bit easier. A large hammer, especially for removing the spindle from the strut assembly and sometimes your disc rotors if they're seized onto the hubs. A couple of tools to note as well is a spreader tool. This is for the spindle. This is CTA 4005. You can also use a large chisel, something to help spread it open even easier. If you do not have that spreader tool, you can just hammer it into place. Some paste that we recommend, liquid moly ceramic paste and some liquid moly ceramic compound, as well as some penetrant fluid of your choice. These cars, as they get older, they can be a bit rusty. And if you live in New England like we do, you know the hard work can be a bit hard to get off sometimes. With that said, let's go ahead and get started on this DIY. All right, my good people, today we're working on the passenger side of the TT. However, the steps are going to be identical for the driver's side with the exception of a brake pad wear sensor for the pads and a 10 millimeter nut that holds your headlight level rod to the lower control arm. Not mandatory to remove it, but it's just one 10 millimeter nut that you can zap out. We'll show you the location on this side. Otherwise, it's going to be the same for both left and right. We're going to start by removing our beauty cover first. If you have one of these, go ahead and pop it off now using your choice uh, trim removal tool. You can use a small pick, small flathead screwdriver. Just don't mar up the paint surface of your wheel. From there, we have five 17 millimeter lug bolts to remove. 
If you're working at home on the ground, be sure you crack these open free before you jack up the vehicle. That way you're not spinning everything around and putting any weird strain on the drivetrain. So if you do have an impact gun, then go ahead and just zap them off once you've jacked up your car, which is what we're gonna do now. So to get started, we're gonna start by disconnecting our ABS sensor on the spindle side of things. If you're on the driver's side, you're gonna to wanna to disconnect the brake pad wear sensor connector as well. So let's go ahead and do that now. There's a small tab on the connector. It's just a regular connector that you can push down. Sometimes it helps to push the sensor or the connector in and then pull out. But if these have never been off before, sometimes they can be a bit of a pain. Now that we have our ABS connector off, we're gonna undo this metal clip that holds our brake line to this tab right here. Just using the flathead screwdriver to get it started. And then with that, you can pull the line through and now it's free. And that's gonna give us access to that 10 millimeter bolt that holds this whole tab to our spindle assembly. And for that, we'll just be using a 10 millimeter socket on a quarter inch ratchet. You can also use a small wrench here if you want. Removing this 10 millimeter nut is gonna give us the option to swing the brake caliper all the way over out of our way once we get to that point. But for now, I always like to thread these little pieces of hardware back in whenever possible so I don't have to guess where they go later during reassembly. All right, my good people, now that we have this tab undone and we have our ABS sensor off to the line, that'll allow us to swing this brake caliper over as one. Again, it's held in by two 21 millimeter bolts, which we'll remove in a moment. If you're looking to separate the caliper from the carrier, you're gonna need a seven millimeter hex as well. Now, before we do that, since we're gonna have to remove this axle bolt and the whole assembly to get this strut job done, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is use the brakes as uh, leverage, if you will, to break this nut free using the impact gun. For those of you working at home, not using an impact gun, you're gonna wanna crack this bolt just a quarter turn, no more than 90 degrees, especially if you're not replacing the bearing. Any more than that, and you can risk damaging the bearing with the bearing being under load. If you have an impact, I recommend you break it free with that instead. That way you don't risk damaging the bearing if you're not replacing it. So on the ground, quarter degree turn, then you can go ahead and remove it the rest of the way once you've jacked up the vehicle. With an impact, we can just go ahead and do it dry in the air. What I recommend, despite of which way you do it, is kind of wedge something to keep this whole assembly from spinning. I'm gonna do two things here. One, we're gonna take a flathead screwdriver. We're gonna shove it between the caliper carrier and the caliper itself, and just one of the veins in the rotor. That's gonna keep the rotor from spinning, just like that. And then the next thing I'm gonna do, just for insurance, is I'm gonna thread in a lug bolt, and that'll keep the hub assembly from spinning behind the disc rotor, just as insurance. You don't want everything to spin around, you don't wanna shear off that uh, rotor set screw, just insurance. So, flathead screwdriver, we have one lug bolt threaded in. Now we're gonna grab our 24 millimeter 12 point and just break this bolt loose for now. Um, there are some vehicles that use a hex head. Just make sure you know which piece of hardware your vehicle has before you start on this DIY. For those of you not replacing the bearing, you do have to replace that bolt by itself. So just make sure you have that handy before you do this job. All right, we're gonna hang on to that bolt for now, but for now we know it's free. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and remove the two 21 millimeter bolts that hold our whole caliper assembly to the spindle here so we can swing it over and hang it. Using a 21 on a half inch ratchet, that'll give us enough leverage to break these free. All right, once you have broken them free, you can remove them by hand the rest of the way. And then we'll swing our caliper over and hang it. With our two 21s undone, we can go ahead and swing this caliper over. And I'm just gonna use my caliper hook. Let's hang it through one of these carrier bolts and then hook it on the back by our hard lines. There's a metal tab back there that holds them in place. Our next step to free up the spindle is gonna to be to undo our sway bar end link. So let's go ahead and do that now. To undo that sway bar end link, you're gonna need an 18 millimeter socket or a wrench and an M6 triple square to counter hold the center of the ball joint from spinning on you. We're gonna use the pass through socket set just because we have it handy and it has the right tools in it. But if you don't have that, you can use a wrench like I mentioned. The goal here is simply to counter hold the center of the stud there so that it doesn't spin on you forever. So I'm gonna grab the 18 first and just break the nut free from the strut. Just corrosion that kind of holds it in place. And then we'll get to counter holding with the M6. You wanna make sure your bit is seated in there all the way. The last thing you wanna do is strip that or break your bit. Then you're gonna be in a world of hurt. 
Right now I'm wedging my counter hold tool up against the wheel well, letting that take all the counter hold stress while I undo the nut with the other hand. If you're having a hard time accessing the sway bar and link hardware, just put your key in the ignition, turn it forward and back to unlock the steering wheel, then you can just turn the whole assembly depending on whatever side you're working on. But now that that is removed, we can go ahead and just slide that out. There we go. Now that we have the sway bar end link removed, the next thing I want to work on, which may be skipping ahead, but I like the process of this better, is we're going to work on removing the pinch bolt and just starting to break the spindle free from the strut. Now, the reason I want to do that before undoing the tie rod end is simply due to the fact that if we undo the tie rod end and everything's just going to be spinning around on us, it's going to be a little bit chaotic. So we'll simply work on removing the pinch bolt and separating these two pieces a bit, and then we can continue on with the tie rod and ball joint. So, all right, to undo the pinch bolt, we're going to need an triple square bit. We have an M14 that we're going to use on the impact, and we have an 18 millimeter wrench, which we're going to use to counter hold. Again, if you don't have an impact, just use a large breaker bar to break this pinch bolt free, and then you can remove it from there. Now we have those two undone. We can remove the nut and the bolt. Just due to the age and how long these components have been together, this isn't just gonna fall and collapse on itself. Matter of fact, it won't fall out all the way as much as we would love to, because then that means we wouldn't have to take everything apart, but it is what it is. With that undone, we're gonna grab our spreader tool and we're just gonna get it started on the back of the spindle and just work this off, I'm talking maybe a quarter of an inch. We're not trying to remove it all the way just yet, we're simply just trying to break it free. This is also a good point to use if you don't have the splitter tool, a chisel or something wide like what I showed you at the beginning of the video and that you can hammer in here just to split these two halves together a bit. Now that we have that split, we're just gonna go ahead and give the spindle a couple taps to break it free. I'm gonna use the uh, brass punch I have here and the hammer and just kind of give it a couple whacks. Now that that's broken free, we can go ahead and work on the next two things, which is gonna be the tie rod end as well as the axle bolt. Now the axle bolt, the reason we hung onto it before is simply because we're gonna use it to drive out um, the axle itself. Right now I have it threaded all the way to the bottom of the bearing, it's bottomed out. I'm gonna back it out maybe two or three turns. Not a whole lot as I don't wanna damage the threads in the axle. And we're just gonna use our hammer just to break the initial um, seal free if you will. There you can see the bolt bottomed out and give it a couple more wax. It's barely taking any force, so I know that that axle is going to come out no problem, but sometimes these can be really seized in there. So use penetrating fluid if you need to, and then we can remove the bolt in full. Another neat trick you can do is if you don't want to use the bolt and risk damaging the threads, use a soft brass punch like the one that we're using today. Get that in place nicely and you can use that to break the initial seal from the axle to the bearing. Now we know our axle is going to come out and it's going to free itself up from the wheel bearing. Before we hop on over to the tie rod, our next move is going to be to remove our rotor and our backing plate. So we're going to grab our T30 and break that set screw free. Obviously our rotor did not move, it is seized on to this hub. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to thread a lug bolt back in and just give it a couple wax with the hammer to remove it. Now we are replacing this disc as part of a brake job DIY. Be sure to check that out on the channel. So don't mind me hitting the face of the rotor here. If you are not replacing your brakes, do not hit anywhere where your pad is gonna contact. Be very gentle with it. As a matter of fact, you can just hit the hub a bit. And if that doesn't do it, work your way around a bit more. All right, now we can remove that. And then for those of you that are not replacing your wheel bearing with us, this would be a great time to go ahead and just wire wheel the surface of this hub here so that when you reassemble everything, it's ready to go. But with that done, we have three T30s that hold our backing plate in place. So let's go ahead and remove that now. Now we have those three T30s removed. We can simply remove this plate. Feel free, this is a great point to clean it up, repaint it if it's a little bit crusty. Now we can go ahead and undo our tie rod end. This is gonna be a 21 millimeter nut with a six millimeter counter hold in here. Uh, I'm gonna use the impact to initially zap this off. This has probably been in here since the car was new, so I don't think the ball joint's gonna spin on us. Now we can do one of two things. We can go ahead and just lightly thread this nut back on, 
We're gonna make it flush with the end of the ball joint stud here. And the reason we wanna do that is if we're gonna go ahead and hammer this out, let's just say you don't have a ball joint removal tool, you can use that as long as they're flush and you're not flattening either the nut or the stud, you can go ahead and hammer that out. The other thing you can do is take your ball joint separator tool with the nut still in place like we have it right now and work on breaking that free, which is the route we're gonna take. Just be mindful when you do that, you don't wanna risk damaging the boot. If you're replacing the tie rod, then go ahead and go wild. If you're not, just be mindful of the boot. I'm gonna take my CTA tool and just get it started on here. I'm gonna tap it into place gently. Again, we still have the nut on here. We don't want the tool to just fly off and we don't want the tie rod to just fly off either and risk hitting us or something else. All right, with that nicely situated there, I'm gonna go ahead and snug this top bolt up. This is a 24 millimeter bolt. You can use a wrench or socket. We have an impact socket, which we'll just go ahead and give a quick zap to. There we go. Boot is still good on the ball joint of the tie rod, which is great. We're gonna use our six mil counter hold and a 21 millimeter socket to get that off once more. All right, beautiful. Now that we have that undone, we can go ahead and just simply pull it out and let it hang off to the side with our brake caliper. Moving forward, our next plan of attack is gonna to be to undo the three nuts that hold our ball joint to our lower control arm. We have three 16 millimeter nuts to undo at the bottom of the ball joint. Quick thing, if you're not replacing the ball joint, I highly suggest use a Sharpie or a paint pen to mark the location of the nuts on the ball joint so that your alignment isn't too far off when you go to bring it to the alignment shop after you're done with this DIY, which you will have to do. For us, we're replacing the ball joint, so it's really irrelevant uh, what position they're in right now as we're gonna be replacing the whole piece and taking it straight to the alignment shop right down the road. But for now, three 16 millimeter nuts, I'm gonna zap them off. A regular socket or wrench will do. The arm is naturally gonna wanna spring up, which is completely fine. Not a problem, if anything, it'll make removal a lot easier. So you can just do that. And now most of our spindle is free. Now we're gonna go ahead and drive our axle the rest of the way out using our brass punch and hammer. Uh, if you don't have either one and you don't wanna use the bolt method, you can use a small pry tool on the back and just pry from the back of the axle. All right, now that that's free, the next thing on our list is gonna be to remove the spindle from the strut. You can do this one of two ways. You can take this off completely as one piece and work at it on the bench, or you can use the strut being held into the strut tower to kind of hold that part of the uh, assembly together while you work on removing the lower half. We're gonna join them together probably on the workbench, but for separating, we're gonna give it a shot having the car hold the strut in for us since I'm working by myself. If not, we'll take everything to the workbench as one and work at it that way. So spreader tool one more time in the back there. When the spreader tool is doing its job properly, it should come down that easy as you saw. Of course, penetrating fluid the night before never hurts or before you start the job. And boom, baby, here is our spindle. We're gonna go ahead and bring this over to the vise now and we're gonna just get it ready to replace the wheel bearing and ball joint assembly. And then we'll pick it up with removing our strut. So let's go ahead and do that now. Now we're gonna go ahead and work on removing the ball joint. It's held in by an 18 millimeter nut and a T40 counter hold. First, I'm gonna take the 18 and just break the initial tightness of the nut free from the, from the spindle. And then we'll set up our pass through set to break that free all the way. Just like the tie rod, this ball joint has been in here so long that it is literally just not spinning. So makes it a little bit easier for removal, at least for the removal of the nut. Similar like we did with the tie rod end though, we're gonna put the nut right back on at the beginning. And we're gonna use our ball joint remover tool to blast that off without causing this to go flying or the tool to go flying. So the nuts lightly threaded on there, just enough so that we can remove it after the fact and I will install our ball joint removal tool and get that off. That should be situated enough for us to get this popped off. Again, for this tool, you need a 24 millimeter socket or wrench. We're gonna use the socket on the impact. Just give it a quick zap. And with that is our old ball joint off. We can just go ahead and install our new one right away. Old one, super easy. Not terrible, I've seen worse. The boot's not ripped or anything, but it's definitely a little bit tired. The new one is <laughs> nice and stiff compared to the old one, not really dancing around. So that'll give us a nice tight feel when driving. We'll get our ball joint in place. 
We'll get our new nut started. These have thread locker on them from the factory. So you want to make sure if for some reason you lose a nut or you're reusing a nut, put a little bit of thread locker on that. Now we'll use our 18 once more, our pass through socket with our T40 as our counter hold. And we're going to snug this all the way down and then we're going to torque it down to 20 Newton meters plus an additional 90 degrees. All right, well, we've been blessed twice by the ball joint gods. I was able to get that nut all the way on without the center of the ball joint spinning on us, which is, I don't know, that never happens to me. So I'll take it. But just to give you an idea of what the counter hold setup would look like, similar to what we did on the tie rod, we feed our socket in, use one to hold, and then tighten with the other one. Now that that's most of the way there, we'll set up our torque wrench with a proper 18 millimeter socket and snug that down. Not a whole lot, as you can see, we got to it almost immediately. And that was just after snugging it down by hand. We'll make a mark on our nut. If you have a torque wrench with an angle mode, now would be the time to use it. And we'll just rotate it an additional 90 degrees or a quarter turn. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. From here, we can move on to removing our old wheel bearing. You're gonna need another triple square for that. These are held in by M12 bolts. So I'm just gonna use the impact to zap them out because we have it here, but a regular ratchet will work just fine. We're gonna go ahead and get all four of those out now. The most important thing, whether you're doing these wheel bearings out like we are on the table, or you're, maybe you're just watching this video to do the wheel bearing in general on your car, the bit needs to be seated all the way in to these triple square bolts. If the bit's slightly out, you're gonna strip them and these are such a pain in the butt to get out. So make sure that no matter what tool you're using or what you're working on, whenever it comes to triple squares, they are fully seated all the way in. All right, we got all four of those out. Now we're gonna just remove the wheel bearing. In some cases, you can just pull them out on the other side and they'll come right out. This one's been in here for 13 years, 14 years, wow, 14 years, happy birthday and uh, 122,000 miles, so I know it's gonna be a bit of a fight. I'm just gonna use the brass punch and just hit it out from the backside. You can also hit it from the flange on the front, but using a hammer and the brass punch from the back will do the trick. Just be mindful, your ABS sensor, if you kept it in place like we did, don't hit that, don't damage it. Just work your way around it. With our old wheel bearing out, the next step is gonna to be to clean the face of the spindle here, which we'll show you in just a moment. If you've watched the wheel bearing replacement on our Golf R video, it's gonna be the exact same process. For this, you can use an emery cloth, you can use a wire wheel or wire brush. The goal is not to remove any metal, it's simply to clean up any oxidation that was left behind. So that when our new bearing goes in, it has a nice smooth home to go into. Again, if your ABS sensor is still in place, be very careful of that. Avoid touching that or hitting it with anything that you're using to clean up. We have a small wire wheel on the drill. We're just gonna give it a quick zap and then we'll wipe it down. The next step is optional, but I would like to use a little bit of an anti-seize compound. In this case, I'm gonna use some liquid moly ceramic paste just to coat the outside where this bearing's gonna go in so that the next time someone does this job, they have a little bit of an easier time removing that bearing, hopefully. It's also a great opportunity to clean the inside of the spindle where the strut sits if you haven't done so already. A little bit of liquid moly paste. Again, it's not an art project. We're just coating the outside edge a bit so that that bearing doesn't seize into the spindle in the future. Definitely don't want to get any of this on your sensor if it's still in place. Now we can go ahead and seat our bearing in. This can be of a, a bit of a tight fit, so you might need to course it a little bit with the hammer. Again, super gently. We're not trying to blow out the bearing here or damage it before we even install it. Try to line up your bolt holes as best as possible. In this case, we were blessed once again. It sat in really nicely. That's the benefit of cleaning the housing really well during this stage of the job. Now we can go ahead and install our new hardware that secures our bearing to the spindle. Now this is where the T60s come into place. They're a little bit different than the triple square that normally come off of these vehicles. So we'll swap over to our T60 once we get these all started by hand. You definitely don't want to just zap these in. You want to start them in by hand and then you can go ahead and snug them down whichever way you prefer. Now I'm just going to quickly go ahead and snug these up with the impact. I'm not going to put any torque on them, literally just going to bottom them out and then we'll pull out the torque wrench and give them a final torque. With that done, we're going to torque these down again to 70 Newton meters plus 90 degrees. So we'll set our torque wrench up. All right. And then I'm just going to tighten them in a X pattern. 
just so that I know everything is seating down properly at the same time, nice and even. With the initial 70, we're gonna use a paint pen to mark them all down. So then we can do our additional 90 degrees or quarter turn. All right, my good people. And with that, we have a fresh wheel bearing ready to go. Again, if you want a POV of this job without removing the spindle, be sure to check out our YouTube video on the Mark 7 Golf R. The idea is gonna be the same. And that one, we do it with the car and everything still on the lift. All right, my good people, back at the TT, we're gonna work on removing the strut assembly from the Audi. Now, one thing to note, on the passenger side that we're working on, there is no T25s that hold this cover down or the cowling. On the driver's side, there is. So at the beginning, we mentioned you need a T25. It's gonna be for that on the driver's side. Passenger side, there's nothing here, a little bit easier. We're gonna pull off this weather stripping seal just a bit. Then we're gonna to wanna to go ahead and lift this up. And we have three 13 millimeter nuts that we wanna zap out. I'm gonna start with the two interior ones first, and then I'll switch over to the last one uh, at the end as I grab the strut from underneath. All right, my good people. And here is our old 122,000 mile strut. We're gonna be reusing some parts from the strut, mainly the coil spring, the bump stop, and the bellow. Uh, the coil springs typically last the lifetime of the vehicle, so as long as yours are in good shape, you can reuse them. Uh, bump stop and bellow in this car are in really good shape. They never bottomed out fully. Uh, again, it was more the, more the strut mounts that failed, so we're gonna reuse those as well. Sometimes these parts can be NLA, so it is a good thing to inspect everything before you tear into it if possible. But for now, let's head over to the table and we'll show you how to disassemble the strut so you can assemble your new one. All right, my good people, over at the workbench, we're gonna work on disassembling our old strut assembly so we can reuse some of the parts, including the coil spring. Again, this is the most uh, critical part of the job, the part where you don't wanna mess up. If you don't have the proper tools or you're not comfortable doing this, again, just take it somewhere to get the struts disassembled and reassembled with your new parts. We have a spring compressor here, ready to go with the correct plates on it. We're gonna go and put it on our coil spring. This tool specifically uses a 22 millimeter socket, which I'm gonna use to compress the coil spring. Now at this point, everything is nice and loosey-goosey. The strut is pretty much free from the coil spring. We're gonna use our pass-through socket set. This is a 21 millimeter socket. And then we're gonna use a seven millimeter hex to counter hold with. The new struts use a 22 millimeter locking nut. So just keep in mind, sometimes the hardware size may change when you're doing these jobs. All right, we have our old nut off. We can take the old strut mount out. We're gonna use the bump stop once more. You can just go ahead and pop that on the inside of our strut mount for easy install later on. I'm gonna go ahead and remove with our flathead the rest of this bearing that's stuck there. We can pull the coil, or we can pull the strut out of the coil spring. We'll keep that boot. Now you'll see on here, and I'll show you on the new one, there is a hard stop on the bottom of the spring perch. That's where the bottom of your coil spring is gonna butt up to. The top is kind of a free for all, so you don't have to worry about positioning the top right. You definitely wanna make sure you clock the bottom of your spring in the correct position against the stop here. It's pretty self-explanatory. They really only go on one way. Now we can take our new strut and get that ready for assembly. We'll take our locking nut off that comes with it. If you want, you can go ahead and install the bellow now. kind of sits on there like that. We can go ahead and feed our coil spring over our strut now. Then we can take our bump stop. We have our strut mount with our new bearing already in place. We can go ahead and feed that over. So you can see this is a perfectly flat circle so the coil spring can seat wherever. Not a big deal. You just want to make sure you clock the bottom of it correctly. With that there, we can start our new, this case, 22 millimeter locking nut. Now we have our 22 millimeter nut started on the top of our Bilstein, and we're just gonna go ahead and snug them down. The torque spec for this nut is 60 Newton meters, so if you have the ability to torque it down, feel free to go and do so. We're just gonna use the old calibrated wrist today, and we'll make it nice and tight. 60 Newton meters isn't too much, so it shouldn't be hard to achieve that just by hand. That's pretty solid on there. That nut's not gonna go anywhere. Now we can go ahead and back off the coil spring compressor, and we can make sure that the bottom of our coil spring seats properly on the bottom of our spring perch. And there we go, my good people. 
we have a new strut ready for install. So now that we have this ready to go, let's head over back to the vise and we're gonna join the strut with the spindle now outside of the car and then we'll put them in as one unit. All right, over at the vise, we're gonna work on feeding our strut back into our spindle. I'm gonna use the spreader tool to open this a bit so that the strut can go in easily. Again, if you don't have that tool, you can use something like a chisel or something that'll widen up as you press it in. Just keep in mind the back of these struts do have a little tab that can sometimes be annoying in this case. That has to go through there. It's an alignment tab that lets you know the strut is going in the right way. And then we'll take our strut and start feeding it in. On the back of the strut, you can see there is a small alignment tab. This is what's gonna go on that split part of the spindle. Make sure that your strut is going in the right way. Almost all the way there. There is, which I'll show you in a moment, there is a stop on the inside here that'll bottom out the strut, so it really can only go so far. Our strut is all the way in, and here's that lip that I was talking about before where the bottom of the strut body bottoms out to on the spindle, so it can only go so far. Once you've hit that, you know you are all the way in. And while I have you here and we have the spindle at an easy access, this is not a bad point to go ahead and reinstall your pinch bolt if you'd like to do so now, just so nothing moves around on you. Feed it in the back side just like we had it on the car we have our new nut our new locking nut on the other side all right and then i'm just going to use the impact to snug them up together and then we'll give them a torque again this is an m14 bit for the hardware that doesn't change on the new bolt and an 18 millimeter wrench to counter hold all right and now we'll give it a final torque of 70 newton meters plus an additional 90 degrees there's 70, that's perfect, nothing's moving. I'm gonna make a little mark on my bolt. So I know once we've done our quarter turn here. All right, and with that, my good people, we have a strut assembly and a spindle with a new bearing and new ball joint ready to rock and roll. So let's head over to the Audi and we'll install this and then we'll button up the rest of this DIY. When installing your strut, there's two arrows on the strut mount that you want to pay attention to as you guide it into the strut tower. They're going to face left and right, or in this case, to the front of the vehicle and the back of the vehicle. If they're facing in any other direction, then you're not going to have a fun time trying to get your three new bolts started at the top. So I went ahead and colored them in on the top of the strut tower here with some blue paint marker. Just to give you an idea of what they look like, that's the size of them. I just roughly filled them in. So make sure those are pointing towards the front and back of the car as you install these. That always helps to have a second set of hands whenever you're installing a whole assembly like this. I'm gonna have Mark uh, start the three nuts on top for us when we feed this in, and then from there we can go ahead and take over. All right, with the good help of my good friend Mark, he went ahead and started the three 13 millimeter bolts for us up there. We're just gonna go ahead and snug them up. And as I tighten them down, I'm gonna to try to guide them over the marks of our old hardware just to keep the alignment, again, as much in check as possible so we can get it to the alignment shop. Um, I'll also be supporting it underneath, kind of lifting it up. I don't wanna make the bolts do all the work here when it comes to snugging it up into the strut tower. Now we have our three 13 millimeter bolts snugged down. We're gonna tighten them down to 15 Newton meters plus an additional 90 degrees. All right, with the initial 15, I'm just gonna mark them with a paint pen. You know the drill, my good people. We need an additional quarter turn out of these bolts, and then we can call it good. And there is three. We can go ahead and tuck our cowl back into place. Again, this has no hardware. Driver's side, you have two T25s. We'll tuck our weather stripping back over properly. This holds the front portion of the cowl down into place. And we are done up top. Now we're gonna go ahead and feed our axle back into our hub assembly. Uh, you always wanna clean the splines before you do this, uh, let me see. Get any old debris or rust off of them. We're gonna use some Liquid Molly 508. This is some anti-seize compound. Just gonna use a little bit to lube up the threads so that they don't seize up inside the hub next time this has to come apart. It'll also make the install a little bit easier as well. Now with that all lubed up, we can go ahead and feed the spline end into the hub, uh, turning it to the right or left in this case. Uh, if you're holding the steering wheel, if you're going left, will kind of help everything align itself underneath here and then we can straighten everything out once we feed it into the splines. All right, there we go. And then it pretty much feeds itself in all the way. And while we have this in place, we're just gonna get the three studs 
for the ball joint started so that everything doesn't dance around. And then we'll continue on with the ball joint nuts. Then I'm just gonna grab our new 16 millimeter nuts, get those started by hand. With these nuts snugged up, we're gonna grab a 16 millimeter socket and just torque them down to 40 newton meters plus 45 degrees. Now we can go ahead and resecure our tie rod. So we'll go ahead and feed it over the top here, get our ball joint to end all the way. And we'll take our 21 millimeter nut and get that started. We have our six mil hex, and we have our 21 millimeter socket or wrench, whatever you have at home. And we'll go ahead and get this set up and snug it down. Then we're gonna torque it down to 20 Newton meters plus an additional 90 degrees, just like our ball joint. Okay, that's nice there. We'll hit it with the torque wrench. We'll do the extra 90 just to be sure. All right, now that we have that buttoned up, my good people, let's get a little bit more eye level with the car and we'll continue buttoning up the rest of the items. Next, we're gonna go ahead and reinstall our heat shield. Again, that's held down by three T30s. We're gonna go ahead and snug these three T30s down by hand, but if you wanna torque them down, eight Newton meters is a torque spec for these. All right, now that we have that situated, we can go ahead and reinstall our brake disc. I'm gonna go ahead and use a little ceramic paste on the back here just to keep it from seizing onto the hub, especially since it's a nice new hub. Now we'll take our rotor, we'll set it into place, and then we'll get our T30 ready to go. And then we're just gonna snug it down. All right, next on our list, we're gonna swing our caliper over secure it by the two 21 millimeter bolts, and then we'll worry about plugging in our electricals and attaching our bracket to the spindle once more. All right, still have that 21 that we used earlier, just a moment ago. I'm gonna use that to zap these into place, and then we'll give them the final torque, which is gonna be 200 Newton meters. And for that, we're gonna get underneath the car just so we can get the best leverage here to give those bad boys a good torque. Back up top side of things here, we're gonna go ahead and resecure our ABS cable and the bracket that holds it in place. So I'm gonna pull my 10 out, which I left here earlier. Then we'll grab our 10 mil on our small quarter inch ratchet and we'll just snug it down. This doesn't need a lot of torque, but eight Newton meters would be your bet if you wanna to torque it down. We can take our soft line and feed it in like so in the back and then we'll grab our metal clip and lock it back into place. Now we can plug our ABS cable back in. If you're on the driver's side, make sure you plug your brake pad wear sensor in as well. Okay, and now let's hop over to the sway bar end link and then we'll finalize this job with the big bad axle bolt. Now we can feed our sway bar end link back through the tab here on our strut assembly. All right, we'll grab our 18 millimeter nut and our M6 triple square to counter hold. And we're just gonna snug them up and then give them a final torque of 65 Newton meters. Beautiful, it was basically there. Now with that done, my good people, the last thing on our laundry list of things to do is to reinstall our axle nut. There's two different torque settings for these depending on which bolt you have. If you have a hex size head bolt, you're gonna torque it to 200 Newton meters plus 90 degrees. If you have the 12 point like we do, that's gonna to be torqued down to 70 Newton meters plus 90 degrees. For that, we're just gonna start by threading our bolts in by hand first. I'm gonna take the impact and our 24 millimeter 12 point and literally just snug it up. Beautiful. Similar to how we took it apart, we're gonna thread a lug bolt back in as insurance to keep the hub and the rotor from spinning on each other, if you will. We're gonna take our flathead screwdriver and use that just to jam up the rotor from spinning even more. Again, this is just more insurance here. And now we can set our torque wrench for this bolt to 70 Newton meters, and then we'll give it an additional 90. We're gonna mark the nut and then we're gonna rotate it an additional 90 degrees. And with that, my good people, we can throw our wheel back on and really wrap up this DIY. We'll start our 17 millimeter lug bolts by hand first. The last thing you wanna do is strip your hub, especially after you just installed a nice new one. With the car on the ground, we can torque our wheels down. We have the torque wrench set to 90 foot pounds or 822 Newton meters. Always tighten them in a cross pattern whenever possible. And if you still have it, you can reinstall your beauty cover, 
or center cap over your wheel. That's going to conclude this DIY for today, my good people. Overall, a straightforward job on the TT. Definitely a lot of components that come off and become undone. But other than that, the coil spring being compressed is probably the most uh, stressful part of this whole DIY. So if you can do that, you can certainly do this job at home. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments on what we did today, leave them in the comment section below. And if you like this DIY and you want to see more like them, please consider subscribing. We make new ones all the time. As always, thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.